This video is about the four main programs that I use to make games and more importantly to make tutorials and tools to create games. Now this is a collab with Big Dev with Henrique Campos. We've decided to share our experience and our insights on the programs we use respectively to make games. With a little twist, the tools that we use are free and open source software. This means that they are free as in freedom, you can access the source code, you can add features, you can report bugs, etc. It's not as closed as working with proprietary tools. It comes with its advantages and some of the tools also come with their drawbacks. So um, be sure to go check the video on Big Dev's channel, you'll find a link in the video description, in the top comment, I'll put it everywhere. I'll try to put it on the screen as well. But that said, let's get started with Krita. The first program I'm going to talk about is the digital painting application Krita. Krita is a digital painting program first and foremost, but you can also use it to create game assets. You can use it to create characters that you're going to cut and animate in another program. It also supports vector drawing or also traditional animation frame by frame. Krita has all the core features that you would expect like grids and guides with the ability to snap anywhere on the canvas. You can also rotate the canvas anytime, scale it, move it, mirror it instantly. You can also paint in symmetry. It's built into the program. You have the ability to use the multi brush tool to paint mandalas or patterns. You can even use the repetition mode wrap around to draw tiling textures or draw tiles for tile sets and games for 3D models. There's really a lot that the program can do. You might be wondering why I'm using Krita and not an alternative. It's a personal choice, but I think that painting feels great in this program, partly thanks to the built-in stabilizer. You also have a fairly advanced brush engine, or set of brush engines, should I say, with a lot of parameters to play with, which allowed us to create a wide variety of presets to accommodate for many situations. Another reason is how I can work non-destructively. In this document here, I have imported a few external documents like my grasslands, so I can paint the background separately in a dedicated document and reuse it in multiple Krita documents without altering it or without suffering from the performance loss with many layers in a given document. So if I go to my grasslands, add a brush stroke here and save, you will see it update in my host document. Other features that I absolutely love include the ability to work with reference images, to pin them on the side of your canvas and to have them all the time in front of your painting right next to you while you are working and the ability to transform recursively with any transform tool. Say I want to sculpt the head of my character here. I'll press Ctrl T to enter the free transform mode and I can jump to the liquify tool, which allows me to sculpt my character with a brush. I'm working with many layers at the same time here and it's not a problem for Krita. Anytime I can confirm my transform and Krita will transform all the layers recursively. And I can click to edit my last transform. It's non-destructive at this point. It also works if you are using a selection, which is even a bigger plus for me. The two biggest pain points of Krita have been performances and stability. Performances kept getting better over the past few major releases, and now Krita has been even sponsored by large companies like Intel to work on that. Stability is the current focus for the team and they are working hard on squashing as many bugs as possible. The developers are dedicated to fixing as many bugs as possible and with features like background save, for example, the program keeps getting more pleasant to use. The last great feature I want to mention is that since version 4.0, Krita allows you to code your own add-ons in Python. It has a full API and we have, for example, our tool to batch export game assets. 
which is going to export all your assets to different folders, different paths to quickly import in your game. Let's talk briefly about Blender because I'm sure you already know it and if you don't, you really should check it out. Uh, Blender is an industry standard 3D software, 3D package. It's amazing, to be fair. It's extremely advanced, it's packed with features. It's uh, used in many industries. It not only does the entire 3D pipeline, so you can cover modeling, rendering, animation, VFX, it includes a game engine, but also we can use it for video editing and all the videos you see on the channel are made in Blender. So if you've seen the short documentary style video I made about Japan, entirely edited and graded in Blender. I don't mean to say it's the best video editor out there, it definitely has its limitations, but thanks to the power of Python that we can use to customize the program, it's really powerful for us. We can create our own tools and work very productively with it. So the entire GDQuest team is using Blender right now. Then we are going to use it for 3D. So I used it a little bit back when I was working as a 3D artist. And now we have Luciano working on a character that's going to be animated and ported to the Godot game engine to provide to the entire community. With the version 2.80 bringing the interface to a whole new level, I don't really have a complaint about it. Extremely flexible, powerful, fast. As a user, you may always want more, but to be fair, this is an amazing program already. I was never too religious about software, but that was until I joined the church of Emacs. <laughs> so Emacs is a text editor and a code editor. It's not too impressive out of the box, but this is an extremely flexible and powerful text editor, something I use for a lot, a lot of tasks. I use it with a distribution, just like with Linux, Space Max, a complete setup to get started with Emacs a lot faster, to have consistent keyboard shortcuts, and to offer Vim-like key bindings by default. So it does look polished, modern, so it gives you an agenda, the ability to manage your tasks, projects, to code in lots of languages. When you press the space bar, you get a mnemonic key bindings for all kinds of features you have access to in Emacs. There's a system of layers that you can activate or deactivate that bring a lot of features, many related plugins to your text editor. I have all sorts of layers here that provide functionality like, for example, I have a complete file manager that works with Vim key bindings here, it tells me to search, to delete files. I have the ability to edit code with Vim key bindings and to edit Python in this case. If I go back to this org mode file format here, this is a file format that allows you to organize tasks, but also to have an agenda that syncs with my mobile phone to manage your tasks. You can clock in and out, you can have a Pomodoro timer, you could play music with Spotify from Emacs, Emacs has the best Vim emulation out there. It has lots of plugins and tools. It's a really powerful tool. It can allow you to be very productive and to do things exactly however you want. The good thing is you have Space Max, for example, where hundreds of developers from all around the world contribute and try to polish as much as possible so you don't have to customize everything from scratch if you don't want to. But whenever you want to optimize one function for your workflow, you want to improve a little thing, change some settings, you can. It's extremely flexible. That is why I'm using Emacs. Let me go briefly over Godot because if you're watching the channel, you know that this is the game engine that we cover in most of our tutorials. And so obviously I use it every single day. Godot is a 2D and 3D game engine. It's our tool of choice here at GD Quest to code games. One of the fastest growing open source projects on GitHub year after year. It supports 2D, 3D game creation, exports to desktop, mobile, consoles as well, and uh, HTML5 to the web. 
It's a powerful game engine with a complete editor with major improvements coming every year. It's completely free, both as in free beer and as in free speech. And it's an amazing project for its community, I think. It's a really sane free and open source project where people are invited to contribute, to work together. A really powerful tool as well, so it's well worth following if you want to develop games. I've made conferences about Godot and a complete presentation of the engine. You can find a link probably on the screen in the video description. I invite you to check it out if you're just discovering the engine and you want to learn more. I've been working in the games industry for seven years, something like that, and at first I was into 3D and I was working with 3ds Max and Photoshop, focusing mostly on art. So I was using exclusively proprietary software. I only moved fully to free software recently. It's been a transition over the years and I've learned using them that they can completely fit your needs. For example, Blender 3D is an amazing program. It's used in multiple industries. It's a big program that's very polished with a ton of features. Krita offers a wealth of features. It's a professional application. There's no doubt about that. It's especially good with everything that has to do with painting, with drawing. It keeps getting more and more features as well as stability improvements lately, making it more and more suitable for professional and daily use. As a self-employed designer and now an entrepreneur, I can't afford to work slowly. I wouldn't be working with free and open source software if I couldn't be as productive as with proprietary tools. The thing is, for a long time, even when I was making the Krita tutorials, for example, I was still working with Photoshop. And then I went on to Affinity Designer on Windows, a really impressive application. But now I'm using Krita all the time and I don't want to say there are no constraints because for example, text editing is a bit of a pain. As a result, I stopped using text momentarily because I don't want to go to another application, write the text and copy it to Krita. You can use GIMP to write text, you can use Inkscape. Instead, I prefer to focus on the symbols, on the visuals that I put in my pictures, on keeping things simple and staying efficient. And when the text tools become better because there's work going on them, I will use them again. So there are some specific constraints here and there, but nothing that prevents me from doing my work productively and fast, quite simply. That is it for this video. We will talk more about free software, Linux game creation, as well in other videos. Remember that these are the programs that I use on a daily basis, pretty much. I'm not talking about the programs that you should use or all the great free and open source programs that you can use to make games. GIMP is really good and it keeps getting better. I really recommend it. Inkscape is a solid option if you want to do vector drawing. There's, for example, Tiled, the 2D Tiled Map Editor. That's amazing if you want to make tiled maps for your games. One of the best tools you can find out there. Same thing, I'm not saying that you should use Emacs, although you should, you should join the church. <laughs> uh, no, you don't have to use it yourself. It's a great tool, but you can use another one. There are many great text editors and IDEs. Anyway, go check out Big Dev's video. You will find the link here, here, here. I don't know, but you'll find the link somewhere. Just look around. He's going to give you a different perspective on the tools and different tools that he uses. But that said, I want to thank you kindly for watching. Be creative, have fun, and let's see one another in the next one. Bye-bye. Oops, that's here that we stopped the video.